That concept of giving away your life for someone else. Isn't that an amazing thought? To give away your life for someone else. No greater gift that we have than to lay down your life for a friend. It's amazing, isn't it? It just is. I just want to tell you, you know, the best seats, you know, you, we don't charge you more for the seats up front, okay? And this is what the action, I mean, if you went to a Patriots game, I know you want to be at the 50-yard line, about three, you know, I know where you want to be. So anytime you want to sit up here, let me know. But before that, just wave to each other, say hi, see who you've missed, and then grab a seat. Grab a seat. Uh, the, excitement, the, the excitement this morning was, was born out earlier this week. We had a big power outage in this area this week, and uh, things came on, things came off, and not everything was working here at the church. So earlier today, while well, I had my nice suit and tie on, looking up, no, I'm not suit, my tie on, I was actually up above the ceiling here, and uh, while well, Joanna and the praise team were practicing, I was up there plugging, you know, plugging things in, and uh, it worked out okay. It was a little exciting up there, a little exciting. I'm back in action, aren't I? All right. Well, this morning, folks, uh, is that we're going to be on the belt of truth. We're back in, in Ephesians chapter 6. We're in the last chapter of it. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6. I'm getting a little bit of weirdness on this microphone, aren't I? Did we get just Pete Static? Is that what it is? Okay. Oh, Pete Static. I thought it was Pete Kane. Uh, so in Ephesians chapter 6, I'm going to be looking at the belt of truth, the belt of truth. Uh, it's important. We're going to be looking at all of the armor of God, the six weapons that God gives us in his complete armor, armament, if you will. But today we're going to look at the belt of truth. And we're going to look at four points with respect to the belt of truth. We're going to look at why we wear armor. What is the result of being unarmed or not wearing your armor? We're going to look at wearing the belt of truth. And finally, we're going to look at is that do you have the truth? Do you have the truth? It might seem like that should come first, but it's going to come last, just to say that. But belt of truth, this is the first weapon in the arsenal that God has, is putting, given to us, and it's a foundational piece of uh, weaponry that we need to have because we don't realize that sometimes we're in a war. It doesn't feel like it. It doesn't feel like it because everything's pretty comfortable. We're in a war, and it's a spiritual war. And that's a problem sometimes because we forget that we're in a spiritual war. But uh, there's two sides in the war. There's a side of truth that's with God in the word of God. And there's a side that's with the devil, which is of lies. And as I've said this before, I said again, one, 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 one person you need to really worry about is a really good liar. A really good liar is a person to be fearful of. A really good liar, if you stop believing them, look out. And Satan, the devil, is the best. He really is. So coming into this, let's just have a word of prayer. Get our hearts and minds ready to hear about the belt of truth. Lord, I thank you to be here. Father, please clear my mind and my heart right now, Lord, so that I can just simply speak to my brothers and sisters of the truth of your word, Lord. I'd ask, that, Father, to please your spirit would guide my words the Spirit would be in my brothers' and sisters' hearts as they listen to your word, and you'll be glorified in everything that we do. Father, this is all for you. We love you, and we thank you, Jesus. Amen. All right. First point, why do we wear the armor? Why do we wear the armor of God? What's the purpose of the armor? We put on the armor of God to go into battle. Folks, we are on the offensive. But we are not to be offensive. We're on the offensive. That's why we put the armor of God on. But Jesus was never offensive, nor should we be. When we go into battle, we go into battle with love, a very powerful weapon. This is what we need to keep in mind, with love. We're not to be offensive, but we are on the offense. This is what we really need to have in our minds. We're waging a war. God's army is on the march. We're on the offensive. And it is about souls. That's what we're in a battle for, souls. It's a spiritual battle. That's what we're all about here. Now, for me, early in my career, I, I, uh, I, worked, I worked over in Watertown at the Army Materials and Mechanics Research Center that's not there any longer, uh, not there anymore. And I did a lot of work. I worked for the Department of Defense. 
and I did a lot of work on the armament that soldiers wore, okay? And some of the things I worked on, uh, some pictures that we have up here, we, I worked on Kevlar vests, Kevlar vests that soldiers wore, bulletproof vests. You might have heard the term Kevlar, that's what goes into the vest. That's, so you want to have the Kevlar at the best optimal conditions so it'll stop a bullet. I worked on that in the late 70s. I worked on gas masks, the rubber that goes into a gas mask. I did permeability studies. I put chemical warfare agents onto different types of rubber, butyl rubber, isoprene, different types of rubber, and I measured the amount of time it took for it to break through the rubber so the soldier would know how long they could be in a battle condition where there was chemicals being, being ex they're being exposed to. It's important. And some other protective clothing that I worked on. This is type clothing it was. So that looks like you know, your, your, your average camo, right? You've got a camo, camo on. But the camouflage clothing was impregnated with carbon and other agents that act to absorb chemical warfare agents as a soldier was exposed to them. So they would know in the battlefield how long they could be out there before they succumbed, they were dead. We worked on that. And the last thing I worked on, I don't have any pictures of it, is early detection. So you know when soldiers are out there, they're out and they're, they're in a forward position, they're in a camp, right? And there was always a concern, you know, the enemy would come. And we, we worked on equipment that went around the camp, these units, that were early detection equipment for chemical warfare agents. So what would happen, you could, you could shoot a missile into a camp, right? Psh, psh. But what about the chemical warfare agents you release at ground level and they just come in? Huh? That's what they did. There's different ways you could do this. So when the, when the unit detected it, a signal went into the camp, everyone donned their gear. So those are some of the things I got to deal with from a war, 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 warfare perspective. This preparedness was impressive, but all of this armament was defensive. This was all defensive. It was very cool. And it was important for our soldiers, but it was there. The spiritual warfare, there's an offense and a defense in the spiritual warfare, and it's not like a football game, okay? This is not like a football game. There's no rules. There's no fair play. There's no penalties. There's no sportsmanship in spiritual warfare. There's no referee that's going to throw a flag. There's no instant replay for a recall. That's not how spiritual warfare works. We need to remove this from our mind. Put the patriots out of your mind for a while. This is not football. This is a war. In a war, there's no Geneva Convention in spiritual warfare. There isn't. Now, the offensive nature that I'm talking about with regards to this armament might not be what historically you may have been taught from Sunday school coming up. We always think of the armor as just defending us, just defending us, and it does. I was always taught it's defensive. Why is the armor of God, the complete weaponry, unoffensive in nature? Let me tell you why. It's because of Jesus' last command, which should be our greatest concern. Jesus said, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, is what Jesus said, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded. Note that's a command. When the commander-in-chief gives you a command, you do it. I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So this is a command that we receive. This go. This go is it's continual. Do not stop. Do not retreat. Advance on all nations making disciples. That's what Jesus said to do. This is being on the offense. We're on the offense. This is not waiting, sitting back, waiting for an attack. To have my armor on to protect me. No, this is advancing, going forward. Now, the protective aspect of the armor of God is relevant only in that Satan will attack. Satan is going to attack you and I in this church when we are most vulnerable. When we let our guard down, when we think we're okay, that's when Satan attacks. That's what happens. He's always waiting to do that. And we might think at times, well, you know, Jesus, uh, Jesus wasn't offensive. Well, he wasn't offensive like with his mouth, insulting. I don't mean that. But he was on the offense. He really was. Remember before Pilate, what happened, you know, Pilate was asking these questions, and Jesus said, oh, I don't have any, this is not my kingdom. 
I don't have the army here. If, I had a, if this was my kingdom, it was an army, they would fight. But they're not. It wasn't. However, what did Jesus do? In John chapter 2, he went into the temple and he cleansed it. One man on many, Jesus offensively cleansed the temple. He said, this is a house of prayer. This is a place of sacrifice. That's what he said. Everyone out. That prayer and sacrifice was ordained by God. That's what the temple was ordained by God. Out. Prayer and sacrifice done from the heart is spiritual. Truth is essential in spiritual warfare. Who is the truth? Who is the truth? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. No one. Does that sound offensive to you? Uh-uh. No. You, this ain't happening. That, to me, is on the offense. That's the offense, folks. You're not going to come to the Father except through Jesus. Jesus' sacrifice was sufficient for the Old Testament saints. It was, it, was, it was sufficient for us. And it's sufficient for everyone who will be born. It's always about the gospel. In Galatians 3.8, it says, In the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, well, isn't that what we've learned in Ephesians? That the Gentiles were justified uh, by faith. It says, preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, and you, all nations, will be blessed. The gospel, the death, burial, and resurrect resurrection of Jesus Christ, the faith that Abraham needed to have was given to him. It's always about the gospel. We need to remember that. So we get into our text. Let's start looking at verse 13, it says. Because we need to take a stand. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. To stand. You know, because of the cross, because of the victory of Jesus Christ, we can make a stand. We need to be happy and victorious in our attitudes. We are lights. We should not go around in doldrums. We should not be these people. Yeah, I'm a Christian. How you doing? Is that a light? Life's rough, isn't it? Everything is tough. Isn't things tough? That's not a Christian. We're to be lights. We're to be lights. It doesn't mean we need to do jumping jacks and cartwheels. But we are to be lights. We should be something people want to speak to. Because you don't want to speak to someone that's just in the doldrums of life. I don't. Well, I do because when I, when I see someone like that, I like to jazz them up a little bit. I have fun with people. I like people, sort of. But anyway. But we're going to wear this armor. And uh, we need to have the armor on because the gospel is offensive. There's a time coming where we'll not be able to take our Christian community as casually as we do now. That's a quote by Charles Spurgeon. It's time. We won't be able to take our Christian community as casually as we do now. And I, I think we do. We do take our Christian community casually. We don't realize the cost it takes to be here. The song we just sang, you gave, you gave your life away for me. <sighs> what an appropriate song to show how we should not be casual about our Christian community. Now, what's the result, second point, of being unarmed? Not wearing the armor, OK? What does it mean to be unarmed? What are the consequences of disregarding the truth, is what I'm talking about. Because we're talking about the belt of truth. We're getting to it. Not wearing the armor. I want you to think for a moment, OK? Let's use, let's use the Bible, radical concept. Think of King David. Let's think of King David for a minute. 2 Samuel chapter 11, King David. King David did not put his armor on in that chapter. He did not do it. His army went out to war, and David stayed in Jerusalem. He stayed behind. The great warrior, the great warrior was not ready to go to battle. He did not put his armor on. Do you remember what happened to David? Do you recall what happened to David? He left his army. He left someone else to go out and fight his battle for him. He did. He did. He sent, out, he, sent, he sent his people out there to fight the enemy. And David did not fight his lusts. He stayed in Jerusalem. 
He committed adultery with Bathsheba. He killed the man that went out and fought the battle for him, Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. God sent Nathan to David to have David's lie that he had about all this exposed to himself. David became an adulterer, a murderer, a liar. He brought shame to his kingship, and he destroyed his testimony. Turns out, a little lust goes a long way, doesn't it? Man did not have his armor on. What causes a warrior to not put their armor on? Physical and spiritual armor need to be on. I said that to say this. Do we have our armor, our armor on? We came here for a reason today. Do we have our armor on? Are we thinking about this? Is the word of God central to our lives? How often do I, I question myself, how often do I evaluate my decision-making processes with God involved in it? How often do I pray about it first? Do I look up a verse on it? How often do I even ask my wife? Yeah, my wife even. She's there all the time, except when she's at work. She should be home taking care of me. You know that about me. I need a lot of care. I'm that guy. But the point being is that how often do I consult God? How often am I doing it? Or do I just do what I want to do because that's what I want to do? Think about Uriah for a moment. It's amazing. David sleeps with Bathsheba, has sex with her. She gets pregnant. David calls Uriah back from the battlefield for one express reason, to get Uriah to lay with his wife so that Uriah would think that when the baby is born, it was his. What a lie. Isn't it amazing how God doesn't hide anything? People say, the Bible's got stuff in it. It sure does. The Bible has everything in it. God lays it all out. So he has him come back to sleep with his wife, and Uriah took a stand. It's amazing what Uriah did, what he says. This is what he's saying to David. The ark in Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents. My lord Joab, that was David's, uh, his main general, and the servants of my lord are encamped in open fields. David, they're all out there at battle. They're fighting the battle. David, king, sir, bowing down maybe. Sir, they're all out there. Shall I then go to my house, eat and drink, and lie with my wife? As you live, David, as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. Wow, Uriah took a stand, didn't he? What a stand he took. What an example of wearing your armor, both physical and spiritual. He really did. He, really, he knew God's plan. He was there for it. He was loyal. He was loyal with his life. With his life, he was loyal. Uriah took a stand. That's why I'm asking us, are we, do we have our armor on? It's so important. Think about it. David's debacle, his sin, okay, is recorded in great detail. In great detail in the Bible. Even his lie to Nathan. Why is it recorded this way? Because of the love of God, that's why. God wants us to have the armor on that he give, has given us. So it's recorded this way. We are never out of the reaches of Satan's devices while we're in this flesh. We must never be without the armor. We're still in the flesh, folks. Now let's talk about wearing the belt of truth. The belt of truth. I want you to see two different translations. The New King James Version says, Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth. The English Standard Version says, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, okay? Two different ways of looking at this. But when you, something gets girded up, when you're girding it up in the Bible, it's, it's get yourself ready for something. It might be for battle. It might be to go out into the fields. Because, so I have a couple of pictures for you so you can understand what girding up means. This is a guy in his tunic. There's your tunic. You know, it looks like a dress, but it's not. It's a tunic. This is the style of clothing that they wore. And they had a simple steps to gird up your goins, your, your, gird up your loins. Pull your tunic up, okay? Pull your tunic forward. Pull it between your legs. Pull it to the sides. Tie it in front of you. You're ready for battle. 
But that's what it is to gird up your loins. You see, they would have had the long robe there, but with, 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 with it covering your legs, you couldn't run. You couldn't farm. You couldn't do anything. It was there for a reason, a tunic. That was your clothing. But we're told to gird it up. It makes one ready to do something. That's what the, the emphasis of girding up your loins. And it's found throughout the word of God. Just look at it sometimes. You'll see the girded up, girded up, girded up everywhere. It's getting ready to do something. And we're to be girded up, ready to do something as well. This contest is a spiritual one, and we're in the flesh. You ever think about that? We're in a spiritual war, but I'm in the flesh. That doesn't seem fair, does it? It doesn't seem fair to me. It's like, oh, we're going to go play a, we're gonna go play a game of hockey, but <laughs> Pete, you don't get a stick. That stinks, right? No stick. I'm going to kick the puck. But we do have something. I don't need a stick. I just need my armor. That's all I need. In verse 13, it says, Therefore, take up the whole armor that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. We want to stand. So we put on the armor in an evil, on, the, on an evil day. Which day? Which day is evil? Aren't some days eviler than others? Yeah, isn't it? Isn't it the truth? Can you predict an evil day? No, nope, you can't. That's why we have to have the armor on every single day, all the time. All the time we need to be there. You know what happens sometimes? We get a day, I say, hey, you know what, that's cool. I'm just going to chill today. Chill day. I'm going to read my Bible, prayer. Yeah, I'll pray tomorrow and fellowship. Nah, I'm not going to text Joe, whatever. You know, Dan, I don't care. It's cool. I'm chilling today. Yeah, it's a chill day. You got to remember this. You're a light. So because you're a light, Satan knows your location. That's a radical concept. The enemy knows your location, right? You know what? I think David... What did David do? He was just chilling in Jerusalem, wasn't he? He was just chilling in Jerusalem. Joab will take the army out. They'll whip those other guys. He's just chilling. Next thing you know, he's a villain. He's with Bathsheba, wasn't he? That's how it worked out for David. Just chilling is not what we want to do. Well, you can relax, but you can't take off the armor. You cannot take off the armor. To stand is to not retreat, not to run, but facing the enemy in a frontal assault. That's what it means. This is a frontal assault. We're going to hear more about a frontal assault in the, in the next few weeks. But this stand is first and foremost with the belt of truth, the first item in the complete weaponry of God. All six weapons that are listed here are of God. These weapons are of God. Now, the belt, the belt holds everything together. It's around the loins. So you get your belt on, it's sort of between... You're, you're sort of putting your, 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 your hips, your groin, and like your ribs, your rib cage. This is a pretty soft area, by the way, isn't it? That, that, that belt's going to be going around. It's going to be there. That's our core. Now, if you know anything, that's where your strength actually is in your body in many respects. I know you can have real big arms. You can have a strong core. If you work out or you go to any uh, workout professionals, they say, and you've got to work on your core. You've got to work on your core. Well, you do. Your core is your belly and your back because everything goes from that, doesn't it? You need to have your strength there. It's important. It really is. Think of it. You ever see movers? You know, those big mo the, those moving trucks going about? What do those guys wear? They wear a big belt. They're supporting their core. Ever see those? I uh, know the Olympics. You only see in the Olympics the weightlifters, those monster guys. They're out there. You know, they're lifting up like a Toyota, right? They wear these huge belts. They're supporting their core. It's important to them. And once again, if you've ever hurt your back, which is part of your core, I have many times, and you're over someone's house and they've got a nice cushy, cushy couch, and you've got to try and get up out of it, it's a nightmare. It just hurts because your core is hurt. But the belt goes around your core, and it's very important. It really is. Now, in the book of Ephesians, what we have seen is a mystery has been revealed. And that mystery was that all men have access to the Father, through Christ. A hidden reality has been revealed in Ephesians. In Ephesians 3, 6, it said, and the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body, partakers of his promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. 
Jews and Gentiles, free and slave, everyone, through Christ, through the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's through the gospel. We are on the offense, ladies and gentlemen. We are on the offense because now we are bringing the gospel to the world. That's why we're on the offense. If we don't bring the gospel, who will? To, to bring it, if you're playing a basketball game and some guy says, says, bring it, well, that's offensive, right? He said, bring it. We're to bring the gospel. That's our job. I think for a moment, if you go into a courtroom, courtrooms are great, great examples for a lot of things in the Bible. We're going to a courtroom, and you're going to be a witness in a trial. What do they say to you? You know the routine. Do you swear to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? We all know, the, we all know this thing. We've watched TV. We've seen movies. That's what they say, right? And you say, I do, and you sit down. What's happening is you are willing to come into this courtroom and manifest something that's hidden. It's hidden to the judge, it's hidden to the jury, and it's hidden to the general public. That's what it is. Only you know it. You're going to testify of it. You will bear evidence of this thing. You're going to manifest a hidden reality. That is what the word truth means. It's something that is manifested, uh, uh, that it's manifesting of a hidden reality. And the reality is not revealed. Going into battle without the truth or with mis misinformation about the truth, which is common in Christian circles, Christian circles is not a good idea. It really is. What happens in Christian circles? Well-intentioned people take a position on something as they believe is the truth, simply because they've been told that. Well, that's what I teach at my church. You've got to be careful with that statement. You've got to be careful if I teach something, what if I do it wrong? I hope that you say, Pete, can we chit-chat? I've probably said a few things wrong up here, folks. It's okay. God's got it. Don't worry. But the point being, we do not want to go off with some doctrine of, no, my church says this. And this is what it is. No, no, no. That's not what we want to be. 2 Timothy 2.15. Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to be in this word. It needs to be central to our lives. Study to show ourselves approved. A life without the truth, negating the truth, rejecting the truth, or with a truth that's been perverted is disastrous. It's living in blindness. You know, Jesus even said, he said, blind guides who strain at gnats, strain out gnats and swallow a camel. I can't defile myself with gnats in my food or anything, but I can swallow a camel. He was being sarcastic. You gotta love it. I gotta love it. How is this truth missed? Well, if we don't have the, 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 the word of God, the truth, our minds are, subject, are in subjection to the consensus of the world. You realize that? We're in, we're in subjection to the consensus of the world. And the, when you're in the consensus, you just blend in. You're no longer a light. Think about that. We're called to be lights. No, I just, everyone else is doing it. You know what, at times, you know what I feel like shouting at people? I really do. Listen, because you think it's right doesn't make it right. That's what I think sometimes. How did you come to that conclusion? How did you come to that conclusion in your life? Well, my church said it. <laughs> you know, I mean, you can carry that ad nauseum, okay? Did you take the time to look at the truth and see what it meant? We need to ask that question of ourselves. How did you come to that conclusion? Some standard is going to be in our life controlling our behavior. Is the armor of God involved in that truth that's in our behavior? Some people, sometimes someone will say to you something like, uh, you know, you better behave, right? You know what I want to say to them? Really, I better behave? Tell me, what standard do you want to go, me to behave by? Because I don't think I murdered anyone today. Am I behaving? I don't mean to sound silly, but what's your standard? What are you going to go by? What are you going to go by? And the last point I want to talk about is, do you have the truth? Do you have the truth? Do I have the truth? Do we have the truth? 
I want you to understand something as we get into this. Understanding the truth is hard for me. I don't learn quickly. I've always been like this. It's okay. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm used to it. Okay, when I was in college studying chemistry, I would study for hours and hours. It just didn't come easy. I enjoyed it, right? But it's okay. Stuff doesn't come quickly to me. That's cool. Doesn't bother me. I'm, <laughs> I've been doing it for a lifetime. I think I'm used to it. Okay, it doesn't matter. But, uh, but just telling me that Jesus is the truth, or oh, Jesus is the truth, that doesn't register with me. Does that register with you? Someone, if you go up to someone, well, Jesus is the truth. Really? That's, that's what you think this, it is? That's evangelizing? That's, share, that's not being a light. Yes, it's how we go about that. So work with me on this. I want to do a little role playing now. Well, edgy, not edgy. I want you for a moment to imagine that I am Nicodemus. Do you remember who Nicodemus was? Nicodemus, Pharisee. Okay, he was a Pharisee. He was a ruler of the Jews. In John chapter 3, Nicodemus met with Jesus in private at night alone. That's what, in John chapter 3, that's where the famous, ye must be born again verse comes from. So let's, for a moment, because I want us to have maybe a little bit different understanding about how we come to the truth. Because there's only one truth. But how we get there sometimes is a little bit different. It's different for each of us, our life experiences. Nicodemus's was different than mine, but Jesus is still the truth. So having said that, for a moment, just imagine I'm Nicodemus, and I'm sort of going to give you a, uh, a little interview, okay, post-resurrection. This is somewhere off by the time of the book of Acts. I'm being interviewed by 60 Minutes, and I'm going to give you a little, a little scenario of my interaction that night with Jesus. So this, here I am, Nicodemus. And Nicodemus says, uh, I go, so there I was, seated across the, across the table from Jesus, face to face, eye to eye. It was night, and we were alone. There I am. You've got to understand this. Understand this. Before this meeting, I was not happy with Jesus. I was not happy with Jesus. Oh, I admired him. I respected him. He's brilliant. The words that he said, they were of God. There's no doubt about it in my mind. They were of God. But you have to understand this. I was a Pharisee. I have maintained 613 rules my entire life. 613. It was complicated. It was complicated. Yeah. And I, I kept all those rules. I really did. Okay, I slipped up sometimes. Maybe I didn't keep all of them all the time. But I knew all 613 of those rules, and I knew the importance of each of those rules. This is my life. It was complicated. I'll give you that. But you have to understand this as well. Understand this as well. The day before I met with Jesus, the day before I met with Jesus, Jesus went into the temple and he turned it upside down. He was flipping over tables. He made a whip. He drove people out of the temple. He drove people out of the temple. This is the temple that I spent my entire life protecting. Jesus is driving people out of the temple. Not only that, he's in the temple. He says, you made it as a place of merchandise. He says, this is my father's house, a house of prayer. That's what got me. Who was he to say that this is my father's house? I spent my life, I spent my life guarding that temple. So, before I met with Jesus, I wasn't happy with him. You catching me? <laughs> I wasn't happy with him at all. This man created chaos in the temple, my father's house, I was thinking. How dare you? So there I was. <sighs> that evening, in the dark, I'm walking up to meet with Jesus. In the dark. Walking up the trail. I know where I'm going. I'm walking up the trail to meet Jesus. And I started thinking about what he said. And you know what I realized? The temple was a place of prayer. The temple was a house of prayer. 
I had prayed that my entire life. We Jews, we went there, we, we did sacrifices there. Those sacrifices were a sweet-smelling aroma to God. Yet we had the animals all over the place, polluting that sweet-smelling aroma. We have made that place a, a marketplace. I realized this. You know, before I got to Jesus, that anger I had at him, it was extinguished. I wasn't angry anymore. The truth be told, I was wrong. I was wrong. I really missed the mark, you see. Those money changers had no business being in there. None whatsoever. Those animals, they shouldn't have been where they were. So we sat down to speak, Jesus and I. He's across the table from me. I wasn't angry anymore. I was over it. But I was uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable, not with him. You have to understand Jesus. It was amazing when you were with this man. He brought such peace. You could look into his eyes. You melted. But inside me, I was uncomfortable. Things, things weren't right. I was not right at all. So we talked. Well, basically, he talked a lot. And let me paraphrase for you a little bit about what we discussed, what we discussed, Jesus and I. Jesus says to me, more or less, I'm paraphrasing now. Nicodemus, it's not about the rules. It's not about what you've done. Wow. It's not about the rules. It's not about what I've done. Yeah. Effectively, what Jesus was telling me is that my life was a waste. Understand that I adhere to those rules as tightly as any man has ever adhered to those rules. Okay, my rules, my God, my truth. I felt like a fool. Then he makes this one statement to me, folks. Let me tell you this. He makes this one statement to me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Understand this. I'm a learned man. I'm a learned man. I know the scriptures. <laughs> They're my life's work. I knew that moment who this man was. I knew he was from God. I knew that he was Messiah. I knew who he was. In that one statement, the complications of 613 laws I had maintained were wiped away. The complicated life that I had built was washed away. You know what? It was just like the prophet Isaiah said. What did Isaiah say? He said, he said, all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. My works were nothing. His sacrifice was everything. And trust me, I know sacrifice. I finally understood Isaiah after all these years. What saved me? For God so loved the world, saved me. God's love seen in the perfect sacrifice of Jesus saved me. You see, he was the last sacrifice. And I sat across the table from him. And that is the truth. That would be Nicodemus' testimony, I think. We all get up in the morning, folks. We intend to do the right thing, don't we? Yet we miss the mark. We need to believe that God is more enough, more than enough to cover up our sins. Jesus was, Jesus is, and Jesus will always be the embodiment of truth. The embodiment of truth. In John chapter 1, what did Jesus say? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of Father, full of grace and truth. The promise of God is that he will protect us. We have the armor, folks. We should not foolishly test God, but put the armor on that he has given us. This last statement regarding Jesus. 
Jesus is the word. Take this book, distill it to one word, and that word would be Jesus. He's the truth. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day, Lord. I'm thankful for your word. I'm thankful that you gave, you gave your life away for me and for everyone in this room. Father, please help us to keep that in mind throughout the day. That we would wear this armor, truth, righteousness, all six elements, all the time. That we would not let down our guard. Because when we do, the liar is there to destroy our testimony. Father, this war is about souls, Lord. We are on the offense. Please help us to remember that, Lord, and to be the lights that we're called us to be. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. So here we are. I hope that word was helpful to you in some way, remembering that what the truth is. It's so precious to us. It really is. Okay, give me a break. I need, I need to take, Dan and Joe, would you please take up an offering? I need a break. I even got you some plates. I got you the extra big ones so that people can, I know people can give extra today. Dan, would you please pray? Folks, you go through days with this, keeping this armor on, 